Oh, okay. Yeah. So, welcome, David Bates-Skinner. Uh, so, he is uh, a JGI scientist, and I met him uh, a few years ago, and I went to JGI for uh, a training, a week long training, and I was really uh, very, uh, not surprised, but uh, what is the word? I know what he wants <laughs> yeah, it has a multiplier on the scan. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. And, uh, you know, uh, someone for the invitation, Carol for the organization, the great uh, meetings that we we had so far with different people here. So, yeah, my name is, um, it's funny. I mean, everybody call me David, David, David. I'm trying always to encourage people to call me David because there are so many Davids, you know, in the U.S. So David Paez Espino, I'm a scientist at the JGI for the last, uh, let's say almost four years. I was a uh, postdoc at the JGI. Uh, before that, for three years, I was a postdoc as well at UC Berkeley um, in the group of Jill Banfield uh, for three and a half years before that. Uh, but my, my background is in um, molecular biology uh, and I transition to, to data science and to computational biology. Um, and today, I mean, I'm super happy to be here just talking about viruses. Um, it's, it's a great audience, uh, you know, so I don't have to convince you that microbiomes are great. I don't have to convince you that, that viruses are important. So, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, this is a very informal forum. So for me, stop me at any time so we can uh, dig into some of the details. I'll, I'll give you a glimpse of um, everything that we have done uh, in the last few years. So... Um, the, the first thing that I would like to, to give you is a, is a context um, of uh, where we are, uh, who we are, and, and how I can you know, frame this, uh, this um, presentation. So right now, um, so the JGI is it's, uh, it's a facility that was open um, around 2000. So we are less than 300 people in total. Um, so originated um, for the human um, genome project. So we were... Uh, a facility that um, actually sequenced and uh, analyzed three of the chromosomes of the human genome, and that was the origin of the JGI. And after the human genome um, uh, project was done, so uh, the Department of Energy took over um, the facility uh, in terms of we are now committed to um, science in the uh, umbrella of the DOE projects. And I'll tell you what the mission of the Department of Energy is. So uh, one of the main strengths of the JGI is that we are uh, producing a lot of uh, sequence data. So this is what we produce in the 2018, 220 terabytes of uh, sequences. If you think about numbers, so this is uh, more than, it's almost 190 human genomes per day. This is a, a lot of uh, sequence data. Um, and um, we are this group of people, we are actually right now located in Walnut Creek, uh, which is the East Bay. Uh, close to the uh, to San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but we are meeting, uh, uh, moving right now to a new building. Uh, actually, the next month we'll be in this new building uh, in Berkeley campus in the Berkeley Hills. So we'll be coming back to uh, UC Berkeley community. And as I said, um, right now we are focused not in any human related um, microbiome uh, mission, but uh, so basically we are trying, we are committed to provide this global research community uh, with access to the most advanced integrative genomic uh, genome science capabilities in support of the DOE research mission. So we're developing these new tools uh, for the community and uh, the main areas that we are targeting are actually uh, three, bioenergy, carbon cycling, and biogeochemistry in order to feed these uh, three big areas. So we have five different programs. Uh, the metagenome program, plants, fungi, microbes, and DNA synthesis. And then we are feeding all these programs with different infrastructure. So we have a uh, department of DNA sequencing. Uh, so as I said, we have all type of platforms like uh, Illumina, PacBio, I mean, long reads, short reads, uh, Nanopore as well. Uh, so we have also single cell um, um, uh, group and people working on single cells, metabolomics, methylation, epigenomics, transcriptomics, metatranscriptomics. We are the group of um, uh, working on computational analysis. So we have uh, assemble groups, annotation, uh, HPC, uh, and big data integration and analysis. 
And finally, we have this DNA synthesis that we are uh, uh, developing new pathways uh, from the knowledge that we are gaining from all these, these different programs. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, some of the computational analysis and some of the pipelines that we are developing. Um, and one of the master um, databases that we have in, in, in the JGI is actually this IMG. So we'll be touching uh, a little bit IMG one, one fraction of IMG, which is IMG VR, IMG for viruses. Uh, this stands for Integrated Microbial Genomes. Um, and this is a database that we are, it's not only a database, it's, it's actually a repository in which you can do comparative analysis, comparative genomics and metagenomics. Uh, and it's uh, composed of many metagenomes, many genomes, uh, all the predicted genes with their predicted functions. In total, we have more than 60 billion uh, genes uh, within these over 100,000 data sets that we have. And then we, you know, have a bunch of other uh, metadata associated with these samples, and we can perform all kind of uh, different um, analysis uh, by using this. Uh, we are interested in secondary metabolites, biosynthetic gene clusters, and so on and so forth. In my case, I'm interested in viruses, and that will be, uh, you know, the topic today. But if you look at uh, um, uh, the, the system itself, IMG is actually uh, very popular right now. So we have more than 20,000 uh, people uh, using this uh, across the world, um, uh, pretty much everywhere. So we are offering these uh, workshops that uh, Samuel uh, took uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, if you want to mine these genomes and metagenomes um, from inside um, the, the database and if anybody's interested, so we, in a couple of weeks, we'll have another. So we have this like every uh, six months around, so in, in fall and, and spring. So next uh, November, we'll have, I think actually the, the, the it's full right now, uh, the capacity, but in the case that any of you wants to really want there, so we'll try to sneak you in, uh, you know, so we always can. May I just say? Yeah. This is one of the workshops that you could go to if you were the facilitator of the <laughs> Yeah, so you better sign up for this. Really. <laughs> so yeah, so this is a, a, a very popular tool. Um, and what I want to uh, give you a, an idea is that, you know, the sequencing data is, is gaining more and more and more and more um, um, uh, popularity. So this is uh, actually uh, the different stats that we have only from the JGI uh, and the data that we um, include in the system, in the database in IMG uh, across the different years. So in blue, you have um, uh, isolate data. In orange, you have metagenomic data or microbiome data. Now we have metagenomics and metatranscriptomics. So you can see that it's growing exponentially um, up to uh, 2018. But this is the projection that we have that is going to happen in the next few years. So we'll be, you know, transition from uh, a few uh, thousand uh, of these metagenomes that we have now uh, up to pretty much reaching a million in 2024, 2025. So this is a lot of data uh, to manage and to, and to mine. So taking the advantage of this uh, database, so we were interested in trying to um, understand viruses in the environment. Uh, and if we were able to um, uh, detect them and also um, do some uh, biology with, with, with some of them. So basically I'll try to you know, briefly convince you that viruses are super cool. Uh, I will summarize uh, some of the main, uh, the main uh, results that we have in this Earth's Viron project that some of you could be familiar with. So, uh, we'll talk about uh, the detection pipelines, uh, the prediction pipelines for the host, and also um, what is the distribution of these viruses, and basically we'll uh, tangentially touch a little bit about IMGDR because that will be the, what we'll be touching um, after the, the talk in the, in the workshop. And then I'll show you um, how you can apply this knowledge and, and these pipelines and, and this information to some other unpublished um, um, projects that we have, uh, the, the Metasap project and the wastewater treatment plants um, in Chicago River. So you'll see a little bit why we are applying our tools in this to a couple of uh, big projects. And also I'll try to show you that we now with the knowledge that we have, um, there's no perfect pipeline for detecting all viruses at once. 
so we can tweak uh, some of the parameters and some of the strategies just to uh, detect a specific uh, vital entities. I mean, so we have actually a specific vital detection pipeline for viral pages and megaviruses. I mean, these uh, eukaryotic um, large uh, genomes with their, I mean, viral pages are these viruses able to co-infect with these other viruses in the uh, eukaryotic um, um, unicellular microbes. So those are super cool uh, entities. And also, I'll touch a little bit about one of the big uh, projects that we have right now running, which is the detection of RNA viruses. Because uh, as I said, the majority, I mean, all of the data that we have here are coming from metagenomes. So that means DNA based. So that means that uh, this is DNA viruses. And now we have also metatranscriptomes, and we're doing an analogous um, project with totally different tools because RNA viruses are very different in their biology uh, compared to the DNA ones. And finally, uh, I will try to summarize some of the biotechnological applications uh, that we can actually uh, use for um, uh, all the knowledge that we are gaining um, in all these uh, different steps. So as, a, as an introduction, when, I, when I'm talking about viruses and I talk uh, you know, to anyone, so I'm trying to convince them then uh, always that everything that we see in the news uh, regarding viruses is not the type of virus that we are most interested in. So those are great viruses. Those are uh, usually the type of viruses that you get in the news. So you know, when there is an outbreak of the Zika in different uh, you know, places, when you travel and you get these noroviruses that they give you the uh, uncomfortable diarrhea when you are in certain countries. Uh, so these outbreaks for Ebola um, every year. So we are concerned about the flu. Um, uh, but, but those are just, you know, a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the viruses that we can find um, um, in all uh, the microbiomes that we have right now. So if you think about that, and I don't have to convince you, so we are living in a microbial planet and uh, everything is influenced by um, my, my co microbes. So microbes are basically, you know, ruling uh, the world and they are actually impacting all biogeochemical cycles. And we are part of this uh, uh, environment. So basically we uh, know now that we are impacted. I mean, the human microbiome actually has a very uh, impo important um, um, uh, effect uh, on us uh, in, in, uh, in health status and also maintaining uh, the, the microbiota in our, in our gut and, and, you know, um, and, and, and impacting us in many different levels. So if you look at numbers, so if you compare the total number of uh, human-related viruses compared with the uh, diversity and the abundance of all type of viruses from microbes, these phages and archaeal viruses, so, um, so we're interested in the whole picture and not only focusing on uh, human viruses so far. So now we have different techniques and we can uh, look for these guys so we know that they're super abundant and when we compare the numbers against uh, the total number of uh, cells, so we, here we have uh, an acidic fluorescence uh, image in which you, every single tiny dot that you see here is a vital um, uh, part, particle and then uh, the medium size uh, circles, so they are uh, microbes and then the large one could be uh, some of our uh, unicellular uh, eukaryotes. So we now we can you know predict for different uh, environments, so for, for marine environments, fresh water and soil, the, the total number of viruses that vital like particles that they are contained there, and they usually outnumber um, all um, microbial cells by one or two order of magnitudes. So this is one of the main reasons why we are interested in viruses. So so they are really abundant, right? And it's uh, not only that, it's, uh, I mean, if we compare, so we have, as I said, uh, usually a couple of order of magnitudes. If we, tell, uh, if we take all the different uh, vital entities possible in, in, on Earth uh, compared to the total number of microbes. But when we look at the databases, um, so the, the, the numbers are totally reversed. So if you take how many um, microbial genomes we have in the databases, so right now the numbers are around 100,000 or so. And we only have like a tiny uh, fraction um, um, of, you know, counterparts, uh, vital genomes. So this is totally uh, inverted, the picture here. And even more, if we see the, the total microbial phyla that they have viruses associated with, um, so we only have a tiny fraction of the 100 microbial phyla that we have reported so far uh, that they have viruses associated with them. 
So there's only like a 10% of those guys um, um, uh, reported to have sequences able to infect this microbial phyla. So this was one of the main motivations of, okay, so there are so many, they are very uh, underrepresented in the databases. Uh, there's no much connection with uh, many of the candidate phyla and, uh, and many of the phyla that, um, microbial phyla that they're out there. So can we, you know, do something with this? And the other um, aspect is, um, is to, to see that, you know, viruses are not only abundant, so they are really important. So they are able to impact all these microbial communities that we have said that they're ruling the world, actually. So, uh, I mean, just a couple of examples here. So probably you know that, you know, uh, when there is a bloom of certain type of uh, microbe in the environment, so viruses are actually able to kill the winner, uh, I mean, with this strategy to return uh, certain um, uh, environments to equilibrium. So this is really important from the point of view of the dynamics of uh, the environments. Also, uh, we know that viruses are, you know, like a key um, um, an element for the transfer of uh, genetic uh, information. So, I mean, through the transduction, so they are actually moving and shuffling genes from, from host to host and so on and so forth. And then they're also able to uh, impact the phenotype of many uh, different hosts. So I don't know if you are aware, but um, Biblio cholera, so this is one of these bacteria that contains toxins uh, that they're really uh, bad for, for, for humans. Uh, but this toxin is actually encoded not in the, um, um, in the microbial side of the genome, but in a prophage that is actually uh, encoded in the, in, in the genome. So, so Biblio cholera contains these uh, toxins uh, in a phage that is integrated into the genome. So this is giving the, the toxicity of the, uh, of the cell. Uh, and also there are some other phages that they're able to... Um, um, uh, to add some auxiliary metabolic genes for a better performance of the, of the host in certain environments. So now we know that there are some uh, photosynthesis uh, genes that they could be encoded uh, in some of the phage genomes that they are actually being utilized by the host in certain uh, conditions. So they're great, abundant, uh, ruling the world. So why not trying to have like a big study and trying to uh, come out with uh, um, um, like a global approach to, to find them. So this is the origin of everything. So, um, so we started this Uncovering Earth's Biome project in 2016, 2015, it was published in 2016, uh, a few years from now um, ago. So in which we basically, we had like five main points, bullet points like, uh, so we wanted to discover as many uh, viruses as possible from all these micro uh, biomes that we had uh, um, um, in, in the database. So you know that we have this huge number of um, uh, metagenomes in the database already. Then we want to generate a taxonomic classification uh, just to have a sense of uh, how many unique genomes we have in, in all uh, our collection. Then uh, trying to connect as many possible uh, vital sequences, viral genomes to their hosts uh, computationally. Everything here is computational. Then trying to generate uh, some information about the global distribution of these viruses across the world. And finally, deposit all this information uh, in a public interactive database for people to use it. So, and then along the road, so we found uh, some uh, cool vital entities that they were um, very we are from a biological point of view, and, and we were uh, actually looking at uh, some of those genomes in more detail, and I'll give you a couple of examples if we have time. So um, this is the database. So how we, uh, I mean the database, the pipeline. So how we uh, actually um, detect viruses out of all this pool of uh, sequences that we have. So this is based on two big concepts. Uh, the first one is uh, creating these vital protein families. Uh, those are HMNs, uh, I talked yesterday to some of you, some of you knew about HMNs, some of you didn't. So basically HMNs are um, like, um, models, alignment uh, models that we can you know, map against uh, genes the same way that we are doing BLAST with sequence to sequence. In this case, it's not the sequence, it's a sequence alignment model against uh, some genes. And then um, the concept of uh, species of viruses that we call uh, vital clusters or vital OTUs. So we are 
basically predicting that two sequences are the same if they are not 100% identical. I mean, if they're 100% identical, so they are the same. But uh, so we are being a little bit flexible here, trying to uh, come out with some uh, cutoffs in order to um, to say that this, the virus is the same, um, if, even if they have 95% identity over 85% of the coverage. And I will tell you about details in, in a minute. So basically, what we had yeah, at the beginning was okay. We have ING. This is a database that originally, uh, when we started this, contained uh, around 10,000 samples, eight terabytes of uh, DNA sequences larger than 5 kb. This is the first cutoff that we have in the database. So we are using context larger than 5 kb because in our pipeline, we need to have a certain number of hits to, um, to the models that we create. So uh, in order to, I mean, so we had to have a, like a cutoff at one point, so we decided to have this that could be adjustable um, um, at any point, if, if we justify that. So we have a terabyte of sequences that they are coming from all kinds of environments, human-related environments, uh, cow, rumen, animals, uh, all kind, uh, fresh water, land, uh, plant-associated environments, uh, industrial water, bioreactors, uh, built environments like, um, um, I don't know, the, the subway project that I'm, I'm talking about in a minute as well. All kind of samples, uh, microbial data, everything larger than 5 kb. That's where we are going to fish our viruses. How do we do the fishing? So originally, we took all the isolate viruses, uh, so that was in the database, um, DNA viruses at that time. Um, so there were around 4,000 of them. So we extract all the genes, about uh, 138,000 genes out of all, all of them. And we created this alignment. So basically, we align uh, all versus all, and we create these models that we used in the first round uh, with our cutoffs to fish um, a certain number, 2,000 uh, uncultivated viral genomes. That is this EOV. I mean, so those are environmental uh, viruses. Uh, 2,000 of them that they were long enough, and they were uh, um, uh, spanning all type of uh, metagenomes, and they were um, containing a certain number of uh, hits to this model. So we wanted to have uh, very long genomes that they were very um, well predicted to be viruses from many different environments. So what we did was we took all the genes from all these genomes. Some of the genes were you know, known because they were fished by this. Many of those genes were not known. Uh, so we took all of them, uh, 190,000 genes. We merged with the 138, and we recreate all the models now just to you know, enrich the models with new models from you know, all the environments uh, that we uh, predict here. And we created a, a data set uh, of 25,000 viral protein families, these uh, HMMs. So this is the final set that we use now, these 25,000 uh, enriched models, not only using isolated information, but also metagenomic and known viruses. Uh, with these vital protein families, so now we fish again back to uh, all the data base, and we came out with uh, with a total number of uh, contacts uh, larger than five kb of seven hundred thousand uh, uncultivated vital genomes. This is a lot. Uh, all of them are larger than five kb, which means that you know. So we have a lot of information uh, here. Many of them are complete, many of them because, I mean, they're circular. Uh, um, um, and, and this is a very uh, rich uh, data set that uh, in a month or so uh, for now will be double. Uh, because uh, now we have, instead of 10,000 samples, we have like 17,000 samples. And, you know, I run uh, the same pipeline, exactly the same uh, thing uh, on top of this. 7,000 new publicly available uh, metagenomes, and now we are pretty much doubling the numbers. So uh, in, in just a few days, I'll have the final results, and then we need to uh, upgrade the database. Um, I mean, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Do you do anything, do you, or do you care whether they are prophage sequences that you're covering here or like free virus? We are, um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, how the pipeline is designed is to try to avoid uh, prophages. That's it. Uh, when we uh, benchmark, uh, you know, the tool with the mob community, uh, including prophetes and non-prophetes, and we have used some, some of the complementary tools that they predict prophetes as well, 
So we have a, a, around like a 90%, uh, we predict that they are lytic viruses and we have like a, around a 10% of all the data, it could be prophages. So I'm saying that because of how the, that, uh, how the pipeline works is, um, so you need to have a certain number of hits to our vital protein panelists and you need to not have a certain number of hits against the microbial side. If you have a prophage, and you have, you know, like you have your contact and you have a prophage here. So depending on how long the contact is and how, you know, much you are covering uh, the prophage, so you could have a bunch of uh, good, you know, hits to our models, and then you will have microbial genes. If you have that combination, probably will be discarded. But you could have a scaffold that is a prophage, and you only have a partial prophage, so that will be accepted because I mean there is no microbial genes around. You know, so the, so the, the pipeline is designed to fish more lytic viruses, but because this is a scaffold, uh, so you don't know how many of them are complete uh, at this point. Uh, but I mean, so we have a basket of the questionable ones that they contain a, a, an enriched number uh, of vital uh, hits and also like a high number of uh, microbial hits. So we have that in a basket, and now we can run some other prediction tools for prophages specifically, and we can see, okay, those are prophages now. Also, in, in all the combinations that we have here, so with the isolate viruses, we are um, um, using um, not only isolate viruses, but prophages. So when we group here, so we could have, you know, some of these groups uh, could be uh, having like, uh, I don't know, 90% of uh, unknown uh, metagenomic viruses, and then a few prophages there, so we can predict that all these guys could be a prophet as well. I mean, we have ways. The pipeline is designed to uh, to fish mostly <laughs> lytic viruses, but in the, along the road, while you are getting your final product, so you will have like a like another product that could be the questionable ones that they you can now fish there with some of the other tools that they are uh, you know published. Uh, I mean, there are beer finder, there are beer sorter, there are, you know, some of these uh, other uh, prediction tools that you can use for mining uh, prophages. That would be, uh, yeah, like a compatible um, um, tool. And that's a definitely uh, like a fair uh, point. So once we have all these viruses, what we did it was uh, just to, um, to identify these vital uh, OTUs, I mean, the species-like uh, viruses. So we merge everything that we have here with all the isolate genomes and with all the prophages that there are out there, around 20,000 more. And basically we do the grouping by um, having a 95% um, sequence identity, uh, average nucleotide identity, over 85% of alignment fraction. So, uh, and then we apply a single linkage uh, cluster. So basically what we end up here is like having different uh, clusters, and this, these numbers actually are benchmarked with the isolate viruses as well. Uh, beforehand, just to know that the taxonomy agrees with uh, whatever it's, it's reported so far. So basically what you have here, so there are clusters that they're at least, uh, everything that is connected, every single node here is a, is a vital uh, sequence uh, from here, from here. And then you have, you know, connections of uh, every single dot means that, um, so we have at least, you know, an overlap of 85% uh, of the sequence, at least with a 95% uh, identity. So we consider those um, uh, quasi-species uh, or, I mean, better say, vital OTUs. Mm -hmm. More or less clear? Yes. So this pipeline is not designed for phages, is it? It's designed for phages. Oh, no, 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 it's not only designed, you, you mean, no, 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 it's for all kinds of viruses. So, but then you say that it's designed to avoid for phages. What about the other integrated uh, viruses? Yeah, everything that contains a PFAM that it's not uh, like, um, Everything that contains a PFAM that is not vital, that is a microbial or eukaryotic, so that will be you know put that put it aside. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I mean, the majority of the because I mean, for these guys that we collect here, uh, so the vast majority are double-stranded DNA viruses, and the vast majority are double-stranded DNA phages. So the majority of the the twenty-five thousand uh, models that we have will be fishing uh, phages, because you know, even if we have from here, we have some models that they are coming from, you know, all kinds of viruses, I mean, RNA viruses. I mean, we're not detecting any RNA viruses from, from this side. We are not detecting many single the DNA viruses because, I mean, we have this uh, cutoff of 5,000 base pairs. So there are some families that they are below this threshold. 
So the pipeline is designed uh, to, to get all kinds of viruses that they have similarity to any of the models that they were built based on whatever was in the isolated database plus this collection that the vast majority are phages. So you can, I mean, we end up, you know, with a certain percent of single cell DNA viruses as well, uh, you know, in every single uh, sample that we are looking at. Um, but, you know, the majority will be phages in this case. So we are trying to enrich for, I mean, so this is an annoying uh, process. So this is what we have done at that time. Yeah, hopefully I'll move fast because otherwise I, I won't have any, <laughs> any material covered. So, but basically, uh, I mean, so uh, this is something that we can cover a little bit more in detail later today, but basically if you have a sample, so this is something that people ask me uh, during our meeting. So if you have a sample and you have your sequence or all your reads, um, so basically you, you will have an, an assembled fraction of your context and your unassembled reads here. So with our pipeline, what you can get uh, is three different products. First of all, you know, your viral context from your sample. Then you can compare your viral context with everything that we have in the database. So you can create, uh, you know, so you can see how unique those viruses are compared with the, the rest of the viruses that they are uh, out there. And also you can uh, predict um, some of the low abundant viruses by mapping uh, your reads back to all the context that we have and trying to see, if, even if you don't cover 100% of the, of the whole genome, if you cover 60, 70%, I mean, you can create your cutoffs there. Um, so you can pretty much predict uh, some of those low abundant virus samples. So the nitty gritty details are here uh, in these two different steps uh, that, as I said, so we are using, this is what we provide uh, externally, the, this vital protein family, these 25,000 models. Once you have your context, basically we only, uh, I mean, we recommend to use context larger than 5 kb. You face all the models against uh, all these uh, genes from this context. You create a table with the total number of uh, hits to these vital protein families, the PFAMs. Uh, you resolve that table with the filter steps that we are saying, steps four to seven, like saying more than 20%. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> PFAMs uh, less than 20, than 40%, whatever combination we're seeing <clears throat> that we can um, talk uh, a little bit more later today. So you basically get this, this number. Um, and then you compare it against the databases and then you can create uh, this, this plot. So in, the, in that particular paper, so if you want, you can recreate exactly uh, an example that we have a uh, deposit there with all, I mean, all the files are deposited there, so you can do exactly step by step and recreate exactly uh, uh, <coughs> this example. So you have one sample, one metagenome, so you have the, all the context, uh, you have all the assembled reads, and with all these, so everything that is in blue, so those are files that you have there and you can create yourself by doing uh, everything in your computer. So you have to hear the times. So I think in, in less than a day or in a day, depending how much you work, I mean, eight hours or so, so you can get uh, you know, the, the, the results from, from this uh, experiment. So this is all, all the details that is based on uh, you know, presence, absence of hits to these particular uh, um, uh, vital models or uh, microbial or karyotic uh, models. So, but obviously we have a bunch of sequences um, and you can get your, your sequence, uh, your vital sequence predicted, but if you don't have a, a host predicted, uh, so you have only half of the, of, the, of the story. So as I said, the database is actually enriched right now uh, for pages uh, because of the, you know, the, the composition of the, um, of the models. Uh, and now we have around 5%, uh, 5 to 6% of all the context data. We have the predicted host, around 40,000 of these uh, uncultivated vital genomes. So we use three different approaches in order to, um, to predict the host. The first one is obvious. I mean, so if we have a, a, a cluster, when we are doing the clustering, so if we have a cluster with one or two uh, uh, members that they are coming from isolate, so we can, uh, you know, um, uh, project the information of these um, um, isolates to the whole group. So we can, you know, say something about that. So this is a, like a tiny number, only 2% of those guys uh, are coming from this approach, but this is a very uh, robust approach because I mean, all the sequences here will be 95% identical over 85% of the coverage. Um, and all of this is ben benchmarked with isolates uh, beforehand. 
The second approach is uh, because we have uh, mostly phages, we, we use this CRISPR-Cas uh, spacer uh, approach that uh, probably you are um, aware of. So right now, uh, I mean, everybody's talking about CRISPR-Cas system for uh, human uh, edition uh, or even diagnostic. Uh, but originally, I mean, so the system is actually a, a, an adaptive immune system of uh, microbes, bacteria and archaea that basically what they do is uh, once uh, they have some mobile genetic elements like phages infecting in the first round, so they, and some of these cast genes are able to scan um, <laughs> the, the genome and they uh, take a piece of this um, uh, genetic material, the DNA or RNA, and insert it into the uh, array. So those black boxes are uh, repeat elements and those uh, color uh, guys are snippets of uh, these uh, invasive elements. It could be uh, phages, it could be transposons or plasmids, or, uh, but the majority of the ones that we know, they're uh, coming from phages. So then in the second round, I mean, when this, uh, this is transcribed and mature, and in the second round of infection, so some other cast genes will be, you know, using some of these guides, uh, RNAs, just to, uh, to, 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 um, to interfere with the, with, the, with the phage, and basically to kill and to... Um, uh, create a path into the sequence and, and delete the, the action of the virus. So this is the, how the system works uh, for, for the bacteria and for the archaea. So how can we um, take advantage of that? Is that, I mean, this um, connection between the spacer and the, and the array and the host and the, and the, and the virus is very uh, strong. And now we have the database uh, of all the spacers, I mean, all these uh, snippets coming from all the isolated viruses, uh, oh, sorry, all the isolated genomes, microbial genomes. And we have more than 1.1 million uh, spacers that now we can map against all the 700,000 uh, viruses that we have. And when we get, you know, like, uh, so we only tolerate for one SNP. Uh, this is another thing that is very well benchmarked. Um, so we can predict um, a host, uh, like up to a species level, uh, a host for 3.3% uh, of all the 700,000 uh, viruses that we have. So this is actually based on this um, approach. And finally, we have another similar approach based on the presence of tRNA. So we saw that uh, this is a viral um, genome, um, um, every single um, uh, black triangle here. So it's a tRNA sequence. So what we found is that uh, for uh, a, a large percent of all the 730,000 uh, viruses, so there are some tRNAs uh, in there. So we know that tRNAs are from uh, microbial origin. So we know that they could be insertion points for uh, some of the prophases. We know that some of them are recruiting these tRNAs from the host as well for a better uh, transcription of their uh, genomes as well. Uh, and we benchmark these with the isolates and we so that um, if we find like a perfect match in a tRNA with the uh, tRNA database that we have from all isolates, when we get one of these um, uh, perfect match, in this case, we are being super specific, just a 100%, 100% length and, and identity, so we can predict uh, a host up to a genus level at least for another percent that is not actually uh, uh, included here and here. So at the end of the day, so we have these 40,000 uh, using only these three computational approaches. Now we are, I mean, I discussed this with some of you, so we are now adding some other computational approaches based on um, some hallmark viral protein families that we know that some of these models are actually only infecting um, certain type of uh, hosts. Um, and we are using that uh, knowledge as well, and it's benchmarked with prophages and it works pretty well. So we'll, we, we will add this feature uh, in the in the near future, so there are people also working with tetanucleotide frequency. When you have you know the same tetanucleotide frequency of the phage and the host, so you can somehow predict that they could be related. Uh, there are some other genes, I mean methylases, uh, lysozymes that you can use for at least to a certain uh, taxonomic group, trying to predict which could be uh, a possible host. But with all that said, uh, so you may think, okay, so these guys only found like 5% uh, of their data with the predicted uh, host. It's not that impressive, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's not that impressive. But if you look at, the, um, if you look at the, the tree, the microbial tree of life, so in this case, I mean, here we have archaea and bacteria represented. So everything that's in blue, uh, so those contain uh, some, 
um, um, cultural representatives um, and in, in white, so you have the, the ones without any cultural representatives so far. So what I want to, 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 to I mean, you to pay attention to is that uh, only the ones that they contain any um, uh, gray fraction in the pie chart, in the first pie chart, so those are the only um, um, microbial phyla that we have sequences, viral sequences as associated to uh, before our, our work. And those are based on prophages, and those are based on uh, isolated phages and everything. So only nine groups were actually, uh, um, um, I mean, contain some, um, some uh, uh, viral sequences uh, associated with that. So with all our different, um, you know, um, uh, upgrades of the database and the different uh, papers that we, we, we've been, you know, publishing uh, in this uh, three, four years, so we were little by little, you know, covering some of these. Um, um, I mean, so we have now a certain number of uh, sequences that they're actually only, uh, I mean, that they're infecting some groups that they were not uh, predicted before. But this is actually really important because if you think from the point of view of the phage therapy that we talk uh, with some of you also, uh, that you could be interested. Um, so there were some groups like, for example, Fusobacteria. So we know that many species from Fusobacteria, uh, they're uh, actually causing disease in human uh, patients, uh, some kind of oral disease and, and you know, uh, diseases in the urogenital tract as well. Uh, so now we have more than 500 different vital uh, OTUs that they are actually uh, associated with members of this group. And now people can engineer and can use this knowledge actually to uh, use that for phase therapy. So we have a, a couple of projects with a, with a couple of uh, pharmas that they are using some of these uh, information from, from, from this tree. So hopefully this is a little bit more you know, exciting that only see the 5% um, uh, from the previous slide. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna move a little bit uh, faster now. Um, because I mean, the other question was, okay, so now we have many viruses, we classify them more or less, we predict hosts for some of them, uh, but how do they distribute across the globe, right? So um, there were, before this global analysis that there were people saying, okay, could it be everything everywhere? Uh, you know, is this virus that I have in my, whatever, um, you know, stomach could be, you know, possibly uh, be found in, I don't know, in, 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 in cows or in, uh, you know, in a freshwater source. And these kind of questions, uh, I mean, so we can now with more, the generation of more and more data, so we can try to, to, to think deeper and to get some insights. So basically we have uh, samples from all these different uh, type of habitats. Uh, I mean, we can go deeper into the, uh, into the ontology of these samples and now we have marine. That is, we can go deeper and we have different uh, uh, deep ocean versus estuaries versus many different things. But if we take uh, these uh, four matrices, uh, aquatic environments, uh, including all these type of environments, terrestrial, like soils or the deep subsurface, or host associated environments, host versus plants versus, I call others, I and mean, we have there everything that it could be a mammal or it could be a termite cat or anything. Uh, and the engineer environments, those built environments. What we found, it was something really cool. And is that even taking, uh, if you take these 11 uh, different habitat types, what we found, is that um, the vast majority of all the information that we find, um, I mean, all the sequences of all the vital OTUs were only exclusively found in a single habitat, any of these ones. So that means that if you find a marine virus, or most probably it's gonna be a marine virus, period, not found anywhere else. Even if we were super permissive in our searching uh, criteria in this case. So either because they were single clones only found once and that's it, or because they were found uh, in a cluster but all the members of this cluster were from the same sample. So, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, there's only one sample, it is marine sample, so those are assigned to marine. But I mean, this, the, the big part of the, uh, of the pie is actually multiple samples, different members of, um, uh, of the same cluster, right? So we have a cluster, all the members of there found in multiple samples. All those samples are actually from the same single habitat. This is what that means. And then we have, you know, some fraction for two different habitats, three different habitats, and up to four to 10. So once we had this picture, so we thought, okay, so what about these uh, guys that they are in one or two? So is there matrices that they could be, you know, uh, you know very closely related to each other? So what we discovered here is that uh, we can uh, increase this 84 to 98 
if we actually resolve some of the metadata problems that we have. So this is basically an artifact, uh, these two. So we can grow this pie up to 98% because in some cases we have um, rhizosphere uh, samples that some people annotated as soils and some people annotated as host plants. So those were the two habitats. So when I clean up manually, actually at the first paper, not <laughs> anymore, um, um, all this data, so especially with algae that could be assigned to plants associated or marine, uh, depending on the, uh, the, 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 the different groups that they are depositing the data, or rhizosphere uh, that they could be either soil or plants. So we could resolve this uh, over 14%, um, and we had that 98% of everything uh, was found exclusively in a single type of habitat, which is very uh, you know, impressive. Then we try to, you know, clean up some of the uh, possible yeah, human and, and contamination from reagents, from humans, from everything. Uh, broad host prophages that they could be there, but we still find, you know, some bona fides examples. I mean, just a, a tiny fraction of the of the of the viruses, but we have a tiny fraction of viral sequences that they appear to be bona fide cosmopolitan viruses. I mean, those are the ones that there are people now also working with them. So, but the take home here is that viruses are very specific of their habitat, even though if you go deeper and deeper into the, into the uh, specificity, so you can go uh, um, in the human body, for example, and if you take all the samples that we have from uh, 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 human gut or the oral cavity, and this is uh, actually here, all the viral clusters, I mean, all the viral species, let's say, so you can see, and this is uh, actually like a, um, like a heat map with uh, no, I mean, absence of the vital um, uh, cluster that we are looking at, or, you know, abundance at different levels, uh, you know, from uh, low abundant to really abundant. So you can see these chunks that they see that the viruses are really specific as well of their um, um, subsite. So in this case, I mean, obviously, always there is, a, you know, some uh, fraction, I mean, some of the, 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 um, the vital, the vital context that they could be shared across uh, these two um, um, related uh, environments, but the majority of them are exclusively for, uh, I mean, present in one single sample. As always, I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, those are the ones that we bona fide found uh, that they are uh, across multiple subhabitats within the human gut, uh, with the oral cavity, and then the nosopharyngeal um, um, sites with uh, your genital tract, and I mean, all the different combinations and how um, the human um, vital uh, groups actually are actually connected with uh, mammals, other mammals, uh, and then some environmental samples, some plant samples. Uh, the majority are passed through um, um, uh, vital uh, plant associated uh, viruses and some industrial ones. So, I mean, we have always, you know, exceptions, but the trend is that they're very specific. If we go to some other um, matrices that are a little bit more complex, like, like water, that, you know, everything is connected. Uh, so we see a pattern that it's uh, a little different, but also we can get some information from this. So here we have the different uh, songs, uh, estuary. So, I mean, so the marine samples, they are classified into estuary, uh, coastal water, oceanic water. And within the coastal, we have the coastal water or coastal sediment, oceanic water at the photic level, twilight or the deep ocean or the sediment and also hydrothermal vents. So those are all these acronyms that we have here. Uh, and this is color code by the different ocean. So what we find here is that everything that is shallow, I mean, everything that is coastal water, so depending on the water mass that we are analyzing, so they have totally different patterns, oh, mostly different patterns. So even if they are from the same matrix, so they have uh, different uh, patterns. But if we go to the bathypelagic, uh, whatever we call, I mean, for the deep ocean uh, samples, uh, so we find the same, uh, more or less the same kind of profiles across even the different oceans. So uh, this is another kind of insight that we gain uh, from this um, um, global analysis. But all of that said, um, so basically, um, even if a, a, a vital um, species is very um, endemic of uh, a certain habitat, they're habitat specific, so they are not uh, geographically isolated. So we can find actually uh, the same vital entity, you know, across multiple sites. So here we have all the different samples that we have for marine 
um, um, uh, samples, and then every dot that is connected with another one is because they share at least two uh, viruses in common. Uh, so everything is very well connected in, in, in marine. So the same virus that you find here, you can find it here. The same virus that you find here, you can find it there. Only in marine environments. And then um, this is something that we expect because, I mean, everything's moving. This is something that we didn't expect that much. Uh, so those are all different environments, but they are static environments. They could be fresh water from New Zealand. They share a bunch of different uh, vital uh, sequences with some other freshwater uh, lakes in North America. Uh, so, I mean, in these cases, uh, or soils from, you know, from uh, Asia with uh, North America or Europe uh, with, uh, you know, some different uh, connections where for these uh, type of environments, the dispersion mechanisms of these viruses are not that, that very well understood. And this is something that, you know, there are some other people trying to come out with some uh, interpretations of how these viruses could travel, you know, across these um, 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 geographic distances. So this is pretty much everything that we had. Uh, then we deposit everything in the database, and this is what we will be covering uh, later today, uh, how to um, mine uh, all this information that we generate uh, with these different um, um, approaches. And uh, this is the, the, the data that you have uh, right now in the database. I'll show the, you this uh, later today as well. So basically what you, the take home here is that you can use the user interface just to do some uh, analysis, like mostly blast and then uh, if you want to do your own analysis for, um, for whatever reason you can pretty much download all the information that we have in the database all the sequences all the reference isolates uh, everything that we have here that the spacer um, because we are still validating some of the spacers coming from microbiomes uh, you have all the models uh, for doing the predictions yourself and you have also all the metadata related with host taxonomy habitat and geographic location so if you want to download, uh, you'll keep this uh, presentation and you have a, a couple of places that you can download the data from, uh, from the landing page uh, in these two buttons or from the genome portals from the JGI. So you have another button here and you have the URL. Um, and I will skip these guys because I mean, they're not that important. So I just want to take the last uh, probably, uh, yeah, five to 10 minutes uh, if we can, can we go two minutes or three okay. after? I have no idea if there's someone else coming in. So okay. Until they kick us out. Okay. Basically, uh, I mean, the take home here is that uh, so we have a specific pipeline for um, for everything that we have deposited in IMG right now, but you uh, can apply this information. I mean, all these pipelines and all these tools actually to any kind of project. And and here we have two projects uh, that we are collaborating. They are in published. Uh, they are in a, in a review process right now. One is, of them is the Metasap in which uh, there are uh, different groups uh, across the world uh, trying to um, uh, take samples from all the uh, urban mass uh, transport systems, uh, uh, subways and, and, and buses and everything. So they're swapping um, 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 uh, pretty much all surfaces. And, and, and basically what they do is um, collecting almost 4,000 different samples from 60 cities across the world. And, and they found, um, um, profiles that are specific of certain environments. And we found, you know, specific vital profiles that are specific of certain uh, geographic uh, locations. So basically taking the advantage of this uh, habitat specificity so we can even within this habitat that is uh, closely related to each other so we can say uh, this virus is most probably coming from this specific uh, environment from a subway and most probably from Africa or most probably from Asia or most probably from you know China or from uh, Hong Kong or from you know so you can uh, so there's always like a like a core set of vital uh, genomes and then like a, a specific uh, set of vital genomes uh, for, for, for everything. Then the other one uh, and, and this is what we did and I mean we pretty much uh, this is in, in BioFive right now uh, and we predicted 11,000 new viruses that they were not reported before. And we found these uh, uh, vital profiles that they could be unique uh, for every sample. So then we have this uh, other project in which, uh, so we can apply the information uh, for some other uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas. So in this case, uh, so there's a, a bunch of different waste uh, water treatment plants uh, along the Chicago River. So all these uh, different um, uh, arrows in blue and then um, we have a collection of samples uh, in, in red. And basically the idea here was trying to see if we can predict the quality of the water based on uh, the vitamin uh, profiles. 
Um, and when we compare everything against everything, because right now, so there is only uh, some chemical um, uh, parameters in order to, to, to test the quality of the water. And then when people are looking for microbiology, uh, microbiolo microbiological par parameters, so they only uh, measure the coliforms, right? So now we have a collection of viruses that they seem to be specifically enriched. Uh, and this is what this is trying to represent. Everything that is shared here, that is not shared everywhere. Uh, so we have a collection of viruses that they were all exclusively present in waters with low quality. And when we compare all these guys against the whole database, the majority of the guys that we found here, they were found in, in poor water quality. So now we have a, like, a, like a certain number of pages that if you measure them uh, and you find them, so they could be associated with poor uh, quality of the water. And uh, finally, as I said, um, it, those are the, 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 the global uh, and the, the, the generic pipelines. Uh, but if you are targeting something in particular in, and you are targeting something that's specific for a certain host or for a certain type of viruses, um, so you can specifically try to design uh, pipelines for whatever you're looking for. So this is a, the case of the Bureau of Ages. This is a paper that is accepted right now, finally, in microbiome. So Bureau of Ages are these uh, uh, viruses that they are uh, co-infecting with large uh, giant uh, viruses, uh, some uh, eukaryotic uh, cells. And the, the, the particular um, aspect of these guys is that they have a very um, defined capsid. So what we did, it was, I mean, we applied a specific pipeline for this. So we took all the capsules that they were in the database. Uh, we create our models and then we enrich our models coming back again and, and, and fishing some other sequences from the uh, whole database. And with all these models now, we were able to mine different databases. And then we got uh, these 328 new high quality Bureau of H genomes. If you compare with the ones that they were uh, reported so far, so there were only like five isolates and around uh, 17 uh, total viral pages. And now we are enriching this uh, by uh, like a great number of them. And then obviously we did some phylogeny with them. Uh, we saw that some of these plates that they are now uh, uh, specific of these viral pages are actually associated with certain models with a specific habitats. Some of them were found for the very first time in the human gut and so on and so forth. So you can specifically design uh, pipelines for um, um, the, the target uh, area that you want. And this is exactly the same thing that we are doing with viruses, right? uh, with RNA viruses. So right now we have uh, around 5,000 metanoscriptomes, so that was May 2017, so I'm updating this uh, up to today. So we have 5,000 metanoscriptomes coming from, again, all type of habitats. And basically you can do three different strategies and you can use models for uh, this uh, hallmark gene, the, um, RDRP gene, which is the uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that all the RNA viruses contain. Uh, you can take the capsids that they are very unique, and we know that um, uh, they work pretty well for the uh, discovery of these viral pages before. And then you can also take some non-structural genes. So we are using the, th the three approach, uh, but what we did was just developing new RNA viral capsids coming from all the PFAMs that they were associated with this function. So we were able to um, develop up to 2,000 new capsid models, and now we are fishing hundreds of thousands of uh, new RNA viruses. And this is the next uh, um, big project that we have. So just as a sum up, um, so all this knowledge that we are generating um, from the databases that they could be applied, for example, in phage therapy. So now we have new vital sequences that they could be uh, use for uh, this biotechnological application. We can use it uh, as biomarkers in some cases as well. So we have the example of the water quality. Um, we can use it also as a biomarker of some of the disease. So we have a paper, I didn't talk about this at all, uh, in collaboration with Breck Durkop uh, group, um, in which we find uh, specific viruses that they seem to be related with the uh, IBD disease. Uh, this is something that I skipped but now, uh, so uh, uh, in the talk, so we have also um, predicted some uh, broad host range phages based on this CRISPR-Cas system. So all these viruses that they could be targeting different phyla, so we can use the regulatory elements just to, um, um, to express, uh, you know, things in, in, you know, in different back, backbones uh, without the problem of uh, doing any codon adaptation or anything like that. 
Uh, so this is another thing that we published uh, last year uh, very well, uh, which is uh, you know finding CRISPR's uh, super tiny version of CRISPR Cas systems miniature in phages as well. So we are gaining more and more information about uh, some of those genes, and, and some of them are doing cool things. And now they are using this uh, in a company, in Mammoth Biosciences, for um, diagnostics of uh, some uh, diseases. Um, so by engineering um, these these guys. And, and obviously, so we can apply all these databases for biosecurity, biodefense. Now we are also thinking about vaccines and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm rushing a little bit at the end, uh, uh, but I mean, I don't want to skip uh, the possibility that you can collaborate with us. I mean, so you uh, uh, be, I mean, welcome to just, just check the JGI website. So we have these CSP community science programs and the FICOS programs and some other um, um, programs that you can actually get uh, sequences for free uh, from us if your project actually um, um, aligns well with the mission uh, of the DOE. So, um, and yeah, so those are some of the people that were awarded uh, in 2017 and some of the programs with the FICUS program. Uh, you only, uh, you won't have only access to sequences, but also you will have access to science people uh, and also to infrastructure, uh, uh, the NERSC um, uh, capability that we have. And those are some other projects that they have been awarded uh, last year. And basically uh, the very last slide is just, we're hosting this um, 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 uh, meeting, uh, the user meeting of the JGI. So we are basically uh, coupling uh, this year, uh, the genomics and uh, the genomics of energy and environment uh, meeting with uh, a vital uh, the Vega meeting, which is um, actually uh, on the from the 22nd to the 24th, and then from the 24th to the 26th we have uh, the, the 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 meeting at the JGI. So, thank you very much for your attention, and and thank you very much to everybody who contributed to uh, to to generate these these data sets. But those of us that are going to be in the workshop, maybe we will um, save our questions because we can actually go and have lunch and ask them at the same time. So, yep. um, so for your three approaches to predicting host association or host suffix, how often do they converge and overlap and how often are they completely the same? Yeah, so I, I just I just put the distinct, uh, but they overlap and they are actually, you know, thank God, predicting the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, especially, I mean, we don't have that many uh, tRNA, but uh, but one way to validate this approach is, was actually uh, with all the CRISPR uh, predictions. So when we put on top, I mean, the ones that they had both tRNA and CRISPR-Cas, so they align perfectly to uh, genus label. In some cases, you know, the tRNA, as we talked, so they could be, you know, in multiple species of the same genus. Uh, so, but at the genus level, uh, it's, it's working pretty well. I think most of us are headed to the viral workshop. Right. So. Okay, yeah, awesome. So yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.